Welcome right. all. Yes, go ahead. Take it us. Take to us our off. final day of the um, now post Croy community workshop. We are excited to have you all here with us today. Lots of folks joining, lots of folks engaged. We have a spectacular lineup for you today, but I'll start and introduce myself. I'm Danielle Campbell, and I'm a member of the DARE Collaboratory. Uh, I serve as co-chair alongside Linda D. And I'm super excited to be here with you all today to my illustrious co-host, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael, and I work for Defeat HIV, which is one of the six Martin Delaney collaboratories that's been funded to work specifically on the basic science to support an eventual trade for HIV cure. Um, and I, it's my pleasure and my privilege to be able to guide our conversation today, which is going to be about CROI and the CROI conference, and more specifically than just CROI, but the um, science that is feeding the HIV cure. And we're gonna get the download from four of our guests, who I believe are signed on. And so I would love to give them a chance to uh, introduce themselves. But before that, I wanna go through with one other set of announcements. So let's see, share screen for a second. You all could just humor me for a moment. So here we are for our third uh, session and some housekeeping items just to go through quickly. Um, hopefully you're only gonna be using a phone or a computer because when you use both, you can get a weird feedback loop. So try to stay on one or the other. We are recording this meeting and we will make it available. I posted on the Defeat HIV YouTube channel as well as on the Facebook page. We also then put it with links on the uh, Treatment Action Group's website as well, where you'll be able to find this page uh, for this workshop, all three sessions. You'll be able to get to the slides that have been given to us as well as the videos. Um, you all are gonna be muted, but you can unmute yourself to speak, um, and especially if you wanna ask a question. What's really nice is to put the raise your hand feature down below if you take a look, and we will then call on you if you wanna talk, or if you want to type uh, in the chat feature, we'll be getting to that as well. Also. Be sure that there's nothing going on in the background where you are um, and try to keep that sort of minimum so when you're unmuted we don't have that problem of uh, unwanted noise. This is what it looks like to be muted. This is what it looks like to be unmuted, <laughs> just to review that. Um, and we're encouraging again you to use the chat feature to write your questions down. But again, if you want to ask a question, this is better when it's always live and there's an interaction. So I think saying something and asking something with your own voice and putting breath behind it is powerful and so we are encouraging that as well. Um, lastly, and we haven't really done this before, so I wanted to take a moment and really thank the sponsors of this um, workshop and this session and we should really take a moment and thank all of these different groups. A lot of us might know one or more of them, um, but they all have contributed to the development of this agenda and actually some of them have given some cash to uh, this year's event. In fact, I wanted to signal and uh, uh, point out the University of Washington, Fred Hutch Center for Aging Research. Their CURE Scientific Working Group has sponsored uh, this session. So to all of our sponsors, I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Lots of kisses to you all for the work that you do in your areas as well as the work you've done to help this event be successful. Um, which leads me to this last point, which I always forget to announce. We will have a raffle at the end of this. Session. We have five Amazon gift cards to give away. And if you are interested in winning one of those to play, all you will have to do is fill out our feedback form. And we're gonna be giving that link at the end of today's session. So we will send it out to you and you can use that link right at the end of today's session. Become one of the potential uh, winners of a $50 Amazon gift card. Um, which I think is sweet. And that's all we got here. Hmm, change the view. So we have some illustrious guests with us today and uh, I would like to give them a chance to tell us who they are. And so first, uh, Anne, if you wanna unmute yourself and let us know a little bit about you. Sure. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Anne Sherudi. 
I am an associate professor of pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine, um, and I'm also uh, an affiliate scientist in micro and immuno at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. Um, the work that I do primarily focuses on um, using the non-human primate model to test cure-directed strategies and investigate HIV persistence. Um, and we focus you know, on, on both adult uh, monkey models, but also are quite interested in, in sort of applying a lot of what we're learning on the adult side to a, a pediatric or infant monkey model. And nice to see everybody on the screen. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, Brad. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Brad Jones, Associate Professor at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York. Um, my research focuses on trying to figure out how we can harness CD8 T cells and NK cells to deplete the HIV reservoir. Um, and that work has really led us in a direction recently of thinking that latency may not be um, the only barrier that stops these cells from, from, uh, from killing the reservoir. And we're really interested in this idea that the cells that persist might have been selected for intrinsic resistance to being killed by cytotoxic T cells and developing strategies to overcome those uh, mechanisms um, is something we're particularly excited in pursuing. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining us. Um, Luis. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm Luis Montaner. I'm a professor at the Wistar Institute. And together with the partners in our community and different academic centers, we are overseeing the Beat HIV program. Uh, our emphasis has been on uh, harnessing innate uh, responses uh, as well as adaptive responses through gene therapy. So we have uh, clinical trials underway and our our emphasis has been in to try to monitor how to interface community and research as we go along this journey. So thank you for the invitation and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And is Josephine, has she managed to join us? Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like not being able to make it, at least yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Okay, great. Well, we'll just start with our three guests and thank you again to each of them and to each of you for joining us on today's call. Um, and so I would love to start off with having Danielle have the privilege of giving us a first question. Pitch the ball. Thank you. Give me one second as I switch screens. Hold on, please. <laughs> I'm muted. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'm back. So our first question of the day, and so the questions will pretty much run in sequence. Any of the panelists at any time can feel compelled to come off mute and answer, and we appreciate your answers. In response, Michael, did you give the direction to folks to either type their chats in the comment I or? I okay. did, and so we will make sure that they're reminded of this, that uh, again, if you wanna ask a question, just raise your hand and we will come to you so you can ask it live. Um, or if you want to type it in the chat feature, we'll be monitoring that way as well. So we have two ways of you asking a question, both of them acceptable. Okay. Oh, Linda D has a question. There we go. Hi, yeah, I thought they were going to give us an update and then we were, you know, on what yep. they thought was the most important. And then we were going to ask them questions. I think that might be why you're not hearing from people. But I have to say that I was intrigued by what Brad um, just told us about resistance that, um, oh God, I hope it's not true, but anyway, another obstacle, right? Maybe he can tell us um, what he, uh, what he, you know, the most recent knowledge he has about that other obstacle to HIV cure. There you go. Potential obstacle. Uh, okay, should I, should I, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, so thanks Linda for the huh? question. Can, can you hear me okay? Okay, so yeah, I think there's a few lines of evidence that are converging to support this idea that um, cells that get recognized by CD8 T cells or NK cells don't necessarily die. 
And I think the field has been thinking about this for a long time from the perspective of the CD8 T cell or the NK cell. If this doesn't kill the target cell, it must mean that the CD8 cell isn't strong enough or the NK cell isn't strong enough. And we need to come in with therapeutic approaches to make those better killers. Um, but I think the other side of the coin here is that target cells are not all the same in terms of whether or not they will die if they receive the same um, inducement to die, the same uh, cytotoxic hit, we say, from a cytotoxic, uh, from a CTL or from an NK cell. Um, and so that raises the possibility that the cells that live for a long time and go on to form the reservoir might have been selected for these cells that are better able to survive T cell killing. And I think one talk that stood out to me from this conference um, that I thought was particularly important in this regard was from Kevin Einkoff. And I, I think he's from Matthias Lichterfeld's lab. It might be maybe Xu Yu's lab. I'm not um, entirely sure. But they rolled out a new technology which has the pretty amazing ability to capture both HIV proviral sequence along with the HIV integration site, along with whether or not that exact provirus is making HIV RNA. So is it completely latent or is it expressing itself? Um, and they find that, well, over time on therapy, there's a general reduction in expression from RNA, as you would expect. The expanded clones um, some of these continue to make a lot of RNA and even to increase the amount of RNA that they make over time. So this raises the question of why these aren't getting recognized and killed um, by the immune system. Uh, and so then I would also mention, since I was asked the question, uh, uh, our talk, which has gone in to look at some of the mechanisms that might enable these cells to survive killing. And what we've really been doing, this is all in vitro assays. So we uh, set up kind of optimal conditions where we think that the, the killer T cells should be able to kill the infected cells. Um, they kill many of them, but some survive. And then we can ask what's different about these cells that survive. And we found a number of mechanisms so far. Um, and I think an exciting aspect of that is that some of these might be targetable by drugs. So the first is a kind of a master regulator of survival called BCL2. Um, and there are BCL2 antagonists that are clinically approved. Um, and the most recent one, which we presented, is, is a, a gene called EZH2, which can um, limit the ability to which these infected cells are presenting the virus uh, to cytotoxic T cells. Um, but, but I think, uh, Linda, to kind of your point, I, uh, you know, we, we could think of this as, as yet another barrier. And that's kind of like the pessimistic, uh, I think, approach. Like, even if we overcome latency, now we also have to overcome this resistance. Um, oh, sorry, there's a bit of background. Uh, but I think the other way to look at it is, since there's this evidence suggesting that- uh, Could everyone be sure to mute? I'm gonna mute everyone. <laughs> Just because we have some background noise. It sounds like a TV is on here. And then Brad, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, just so, or you can unmute yourself again, Brad. If, let me see. There we go. Oop, ask to unmute oh, there. Great. Unmute it again. Here you go. Let's do right. that. So, there's something going. It sounded like. Yeah. So there's two ways to look at it. I mean, we could look at it. Okay. Now we have to overcome latency and these barriers to killing. But I wouldn't suggest looking at it necessarily that way because, uh, again, there's this evidence that some of the reservoir is continuing to express uh, antigens in. Uh, individuals on long-term therapy. So that suggests that even if we overcome the resistance by targeting some of these mechanisms that I mentioned or others, maybe we can have an impact on what we're now appreciating as, a, as an active reservoir, kind of alongside the latent reservoir. So I don't think that, um, that all of the obstacles necessarily have to be overcome at the same time to have some impact, even though to get to the eventual goal of eradication, you know, we probably will need combination approaches. And so Brad, we had someone ask a question about the group that you were speaking of. I think it was before what you just mentioned. Uh, Kareen wanted to know what was the name of the group? Yeah, so the, the presenter's name was Kevin Einkoff. I think, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Matthias, Matthias's team. Yeah, is it with, with, uh, yeah. with this? 
Can I ask you, Brad, about the drugs that you mentioned that are already approved that you might be looking at? Can you just tell us a little bit about them? I mean, hopefully they're not, you know, repurposed cancer drugs or they do they come with a lot of toxicity like we've experienced with the other sorts of drugs we've tried or is this going to be easier, you think? Yeah, so obviously an important uh, question and consideration. So I would say that for the BCL2 antagonists, so ABT199, venetoclax, um, the side effect profile is considerable. Um, I'm not a, not a physician, so I, I, I wouldn't want to say it with too much confidence, but I think that there would definitely be um, careful considerations as to whether or not that's something that makes sense to test in the context of otherwise healthy people on antiretroviral therapy. So that's why we're continuing to push down that road to identify new hits. Um, so our new hit, EZH2, there's EZH2 inhibitors, which are approved drugs that have uh, less significant side effect profiles, at least, than the, than the BCL2 antagonists. Mm. We, haven't, we haven't really explored with uh, physicians yet whether or not um, whether or not that seems to be a viable thing to test, but you know, I think we're just we're just barely scratching the surface here. You know, in the screens that we're doing, we're getting hundreds of hits to sift through, and we're trying to prioritize things that have a potential path to the clinic. Um, but I think uh, as we kind of go through that, I hope that we'll come up with some hits that are selective enough that we can try them without an extensive side effect profile and or use different types of targeted delivery systems to get them to just the cells that that we're trying to sensitize to to killing. Um, so let's move on. Um, I wanted to hear what Anne, Anne, what did you think was the most consequential or the most important bit of cure related research that you found at CROI? Um. Well, that's a tough question to answer, but, <laughs> um, you know, I think one thing was clear just to say it at the outset is that this meeting was, uh, you know, not all HIV focused. There was an awful lot of COVID research that was presented for better or for worse. Um, and so, you know, clearly we all know that a lot of uh, HIV clinical trials were put on hold as a result of COVID pan the COVID pandemic. So, um, you know, that I think led to sort of a more limited array of studies being presented. Um, that said, you know, just sort of um, focusing on the, the pediatric side of things, because I that was sort of my charge for this, although I have, there were some other um, really, I think, interesting talks that I'm happy to bring up as well. Um, there were some studies that are sort of diving into um, characterizing the reservoir in perinatally infected infants and children and even adolescents, you know, folks that are and, and older um, that have been infected since birth and looking at um, levels of provirus, uh, kind of characterizing them with more sophisticated assays than really has been done before. So I thought that was nice to see um, from a couple of different one from the um, Karma cohort, that's a bunch of different European centers, um, and then another from a cohort in Mozambique. Um, and so, you know, basically what, what both of those studies have shown, and I think a lot of other people are looking into this as well, that the levels of intact provirus in perinatally infected children who have been now on long-term art are extraordinarily low which on the one hand is um, you know, exciting, which means maybe they're more um, kind of amenable to a cure approach that there's sort of less reservoir to target. Um, on the other hand, you know, some of it may be just a consequence of you know, the assays and blood volumes and the things that we all struggle with in pediatrics. But um, the flip side I think is that when we're thinking about doing pediatric clinical trials, if you're already starting from such a low level, it's awfully challenging to think about how you would measure an effect of your cure intervention, because it's hard to go from undetectable to lower than undetectable. So that's just something that I think was hit home by a couple of the different uh, presentations. Um, I think in terms of the studies that were non-pediatric focused that uh, were actually 
um, trials that were conducted. There were a couple that were presented. Um, one was from Joe Casaza from the VRC. Um, and that was, I think the, I, I, the first time I've seen it presented at a conference, but maybe it's been presented earlier, but this is a very small study, um, but it is of um, adeno associated virus mediated uh, delivery of VRC07, the broadly neutralizing antibody. Um, and it was only eight volunteers, so really small. Um, but they did show that I think, you know, sort of for the first time in humans, that this approach could actually lead to um, uh, expression of VRC07 in a person. Um, and so, and it was, it was pretty well tolerated. They said they had no adverse events. Um, and the, the kind of main limitation was that uh, subset, you know, it's already eight, only eight individuals, so a smaller, even smaller subset of those people did develop um, antibodies against the VRC07, and so that limited the expression in those people, which is definitely a known issue with this approach. But um, it's it's something that I think, you know, there have been a lot of monkey studies, or there are a lot of monkey studies that are going on with this um, Kind of AAV delivery of various uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies or other um, like ECD4, other um, kind of approaches that are designed to reduce the reservoir size. Um, and but this was is the first human study, I believe. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to move on to hear Luis's uh, answer for the same question, though. Like Luis, out of all the things that you saw at Croy related to cure in some way, which uh, really stands out to you. Thank you. So I think, you know, last year was about intact versus defective, right? Last year, we were all wrestling with uh, the new data and the new assay from the Silicano lab, allowing us to detect intact. So we were all very hopeful that this would be the path to measuring the right amount of the amount of residual reservoir that we needed to go after. And I think this year, the biggest news is location, 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 meaning that it's not about the intact alone. It's about where it sits. And we need to now target the ability to measure which of the intact proviruses we need to be worried about. And there is some evidence in the elite controllers that the location may be missed leading, meaning that you may have a lot of copies and still control, which obviously we always view that amount means no control. Right. So the so they are telling us that the location may impact how you may interpret the amount. Mm -hmm. Then the other side, which Brad noted, was that, well, if we always expect the immune system to be controlling what it can see, how come we can have expression without seeing it because this individual has control, but it is expressing RNA. Mm -hmm. So is this, a, is this what we before used to think about a small smoldering antigen amount or expression that keeps the immune system able to control? Or is this a red herring that basically has no impact whatsoever? And so this type of information, I think, has raised some different perception of what it means to measure intact. And second, what would the right immune response needs to be when the virus is being expressed? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that was the biggest news because it basically impacts every cure study that you can think of into how we need to be evaluating the impact of the strategy. Right. Because if we then go, okay, well, we're just going to measure the amount of intact provars, then how do we know that we're not being misled by measuring the intact provars that is quote unquote dead, meaning that it's not being expressed? Right. Or so I think that this dynamic is going to change how we are going to be probing the assumption of measurement versus clinical control. So we still know that clinical control rules, right? So that is what rules in the end. So but the expectation that the intact was going to give us a straight shot towards predicting control, I think that to this year, that idea was out the door. 
Right. And in so my opinion. location, you were not talking about location, like where it is in your body. You're talking no. about specifically where it's located in the nucleus. Yes. Because, you know, the virus comes in and it kind of fits into your cell's nucleus. And right. we thought that once it got there, it meant that it was fair game, that it could be expressed. Right. And now we're learning that depending where it comes in, you can either express or be a dead end, but mm. still have an intact provirus. So the, the then the question is, how do we start teasing that apart in measurements that would not otherwise be looking to determine where it's located because we just were measuring the total amount. So this is related to the famous Lorene Willenberg case that came out to where they were trying to capture what was happening to her, but it's really where HIV embedded in her DNA that made her become an elite controller. Correct. And basically Correct. have such Correct. a low level of HIV because of that. It's all where, where in the DNA HIV embeds. Correct. And I think that that dynamic as to what makes it go one place versus another is a new opportunity to determine how do we go after it? Because now we have to go after the one that is the problem, not necessarily the ones that are dead ends. So, so I think that's going to be some, you know, new area that we should see some activity on. I think on a more strategy side, the presentation that I thought was discouraging was the fact that the the results from Badam Baruch, you know, last year that were really exciting about non-human primates that were given vaccine and BNAPs and they got control. And we all thought, well, that means that their BNAPs could be a, a segue towards remission and control. They reproduced that in NIH and they didn't see the, the same outcome. They didn't see any control. So that then raises the question of, is it the model? Is it the type of anti antibody? But it's not going to be a sure shot, meaning that whatever BNAPs you add and a vaccine, it means that you're going to get control. Mm -hmm. So so that was, I guess, you know, something that it I was disappointed to see, but it's the way it is, right? You get right. one result in one place, then you repeat it, and then you, you learn something new. Right, which is From, something that we always have to cancel people because, you know, everyone's very quick to publish results sometimes, and uh, lots of institutions often trumpet the results, but when they have- Well, but no, no, but what I'm saying is that it's very, it could be, I'm not suggesting that the research was wrong. No, no, no. Because the, 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 the question now is what was different between the approaches and what right. led to one versus another. Exactly. But Big then that, that qualifies the, the first result, right? That doesn't say, right. like for example, antiretroviral therapy, we know that we give antiretroviral therapy to everybody and the virus comes down. And right. there's not the expectation that it will go down you, but not on this other person. Right. So now we have to wrestle with, well, what was different and understanding between both. So looks like now, we have Linda D has a question for you. Linda, did you want to take yourself off mute? Yeah. Um, well, that DNA issue is, um, I guess, I guess, what are the, in other words, do we know uh, what challenges you will face in on one part of the DNA as a result of the other? Um, um, what are, I mean, can you explain a little bit more about the different, different locations on the DNA? I really don't know anything about that. And the other thing is, um, um, how hard is it to pinpoint what spot, you know, is involved? And I guess, what is it harder to do? Will it be harder to deal with in different spots? I mean, you may not know the answers to this stuff yet, but that all occurred to me as you were speaking. Thanks. I mean, I think all the questions that you're raising are are the ones that are being asked moving forward, right? What is, how do we deal with the different locations and are they targetable or not? So, but to kind of give you one example, I don't know if you've seen the cartoons of chromosomes that are like an X mm -hmm. and they have like a little dot in the middle. I don't know if you've seen those types of illustrations. No, so, sorry. So, so, but anyway, let's assume that you see an X at the, the, and then the dot in the middle is usually called the central mirror because it's in the middle, right? For center, central mirror. So an integration that is within that area is transcriptionally silent. So that means that if it goes in there, it basically is not able to be read as RNA. So it's basically a dead end. And that is one of the regions that was described. There are others that are 
when we talk about transcriptionally silent, it means that the virus cannot be read. And as a consequence, the DNA is there, but you can't read it. So that's what we would refer to as a dead zone or, or an area that is not able to make more viral copies, even though the DNA sits in the genome itself. Does that answer your question? Without getting exceedingly technical? Or Brad, yeah, well, you can, no, you can give another shot at this. <laughs> it's helpful, and, and we'll learn more as we go. It just what occurred to me, and I thought you may have, you know, but we'll, you can keep us posted. <laughs> but basically, they described like three different types of regions, all of which were quote unquote silent. And the one I was telling you in the middle of the chromosome is one of the three, but the others are kind of more technical. But the bottom line is it's not being read. It's like a block and lock type of situation. And I think if I'm thinking of the same talk, the kind of one of the concepts was that if the if HIV is integrated in, within a gene, it's more likely to be able to express RNA. Um, but if it's not integrated, if it's in an intergenic region, um, it is less likely to have, uh, to be expressing, expressing RNA. And so that may be, you know, I mean, that's probably oversimplified, but that's a way to think about, um, you know, which of those two different types of intact DNA may be able to be actually induced and replication confident and, and sort of, you know, which ones, the ones that should be induced and replication competent, obviously those are the targets for a cure strategy. But on the flip side, as Luis just said, and I think is coming up in the, the chat, is that maybe if, if we're able to kind of induce the suppression in the block and lock approach, um, that that could be, you know, maybe there's two different approaches for the two different types of, of reservoirs. This is Mark Milano. Uh, one quick question. This is all new to me too. Was the news at the conference uh, where it integrated or the fact that it can integrate at different points? Because I never even knew it could integrate at different points. Has that been known for a while and they just delineated where it does it or is it news that it can integrate into the DNA at different points? Because I've never heard that before. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the uh, sites of integration have been known to be um, very diverse for a long time. Essentially, it, HIV prefers to integrate into into genes and genes that are actively transcribing usually. Um, I think what's, what's new is the evidence showing just how much the immune system or other factors can select and you know, get rid of some of those proviruses that can be expressed, leaving only kind of this, in some cases, in extreme cases, this uh, you know, these, these almost fossils of viruses there, the provirus is still there, but if it's inserted somewhere, as Lewis was describing that, um, where essentially, you know, the, the lights are off, it's an inactive part of the genome, nothing's happening there, then it may never make a virus. And, you know, the other th way I think about this sometimes, I don't know if this is, if this is helpful or, or not, um, but we know, for example, that there's CD4 T cells and there's CD8 T cells. Mm -hmm. uh, the CD4 T cells still have the gene for CD8 in them, but they never express that gene. It doesn't matter. You stimulate them with, you treat them with whatever you want in vitro. Um, those CD4 cells are not going to start to express CD8 because that gene has been permanently turned off. And so if HIV, um, is in a place where it's similarly turned off, then we probably don't have to worry about it. But as Richard nicely explained in the in the chat, also there's a big gray area in between. There's there's some sites of the genome that are very active. Uh, there's some that might be completely shut down, and then there's uh, a whole a whole intermediate range um, that we need to grapple with how to how to uh, deal with. I guess another way to look at it is before, you know, you know that uh, finding Waldo books where you have to like find Waldo in a huge picture. Yeah. So, so before we were not able to find Waldo because we didn't know which was the intact provirus. <laughs> and then we were just blinded by the whole group. Now we know 
that you know how to find them, how to find Waldo. But now the problem is that some of these are in locked rooms and some of them are not in locked rooms. And what they described in this finding was that how to how to identify the locked rooms and the unlocked rooms. And what we knew before is that the var the integration could happen anywhere. What we didn't know before is that once knowing which ones are the Waldos, that they are in locked rooms as well. And that's the part that's new. Thanks, that's really helpful. So can I ask you one thing, Luis? The locked rooms, is are, is it good to be, is that like a block and lock room? We don't have to worry about them. We just have to worry about Correct. the one in the Correct. unlocked rooms, right? Correct. Perfect. Correct. But right. the right. but the irony, or at least the complexity, is that some of these locked rooms have the door open, but Waldo can't get out. So the RNA still gets expressed, but the virus doesn't go anywhere. So uh -huh. that's what Brad was saying, that there's some of these hmm. sites that are still expressing RNA and yet there is control. So then the question is, why is this, why is this not getting rid by the, by the immune system now? So there must be some other layer of evasion, if you like, or lack of ability to see it that is allowing this RNA to be there, but yet not be a problem for, for the individual. So might this unlock the, the block and lock it's sort of um, approach? I mean, we're kind of stuck with that now. We know it, it sounds good, but we don't know how to do it. So might this so, elucidate? So, but, but I mean, one word of caution. What we don't know is that these are very unique people that were described, right? So we don't know whether we're chasing a calico cat or we're actually, it's actually something very common in most people that are living with HIV and under therapy. So, so now the... The focus is let's now that we know these types of questions can be pursued let's go into the majority of people living with hiv that are under antiviral therapy and see how that type of profile reflects itself in these types of settings because what we were talking about is those very few individuals that are able to control the virus without therapy and they're you know they're called elite because they're very very unique so the question is, how do we then try to move that into the majority of people? And so do you know, like, what are the next steps that are being worked on with what has been so far learned research wise? What are they, what are, do you know what's being, are anyone, is anyone pursuing these things that uh, you've mentioned and the questions that we still have to answer? Go ahead, Brett. Maybe I can jump in there. So, so, so I think we have a lot of exciting new assays and it's, it's really about bringing these together and a lot of people are doing that. So to just mention one example, um, there's this assay HIV flow that Nicholas Chamont's lab has been presenting, which lets you reactivate cells ex vivo and see those very few cells that are able to make HIV protein. Um, and so you can sort those, for example, and then use some of the other cutting edge techniques developed by other labs, um, such as MIPSeq. And what MIPSeq does is give you the, let you look at the whole HIV DNA sequence, as well as exactly where it's integrated in the DNA. So now you can bring those three pieces together. This is what the HIV looks like itself. This is where it is. And we know that it was able to get out of the door, as, as Lewis put it, because that's how we identified that cell in the first place. Mm. And so there is, um, and to mention one other, to, to highlight one of the scientific spotlights, there was a talk from Guinevere Lee, who developed a new way to look at the RNA that we're picking up, and then ask, did that RNA come from an intact provirus or a defective provirus? So now we're able to see Waldo um, at a different level, at the RNA level, in addition to the DNA level. So I think there's, there's a lot of work to, to do to bring these things together towards a really comprehensive understanding of how the location in the genome influences the degree to which we need to worry about these proviruses. But I think the exciting thing is we have, we have you know, all of these new tools and we're always hearing about new tools it's hard to keep track of all the different 
uh, SEEK acronyms that we have out there. Um, so the technology is is there. The you know I think um, it, it's going to be it's going to be an exciting journey to sort all of this out. Mm. Um, so we had a question come up in the chat. Um, someone wanted to talk about um, the the month long injectable therapy for HIV, and they were feeling that it is a, a step towards a cure. And we're basically sharing, wouldn't it be better than taking pills? Do you feel that long-term injectables are a step towards a cure or toward a remission? Um, or are they just more about improving people's quality of life so much so that it seems like it's a closer to cure? Do you, what do you guys think? I mean, I think that, the, that there are two parallel developments happening, right? We want the cure, but we also want more sustainable ways to manage people living with HIV and the and the onerous of therapy. So so I think the the long term acting is moving forward very aggressively. So I think that next year's CROI maybe the we'll be talking about long term acting is now becoming more accessible and 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 now then the question is if you have the option to be on a one year dosing regimen, mm -hmm. do you do we still think about the cure agenda in the same way? Uh, now, obviously, that's not going to be the answer for everybody because, you know, even you know, now they're talking about well, how, do, how do those types of approaches line up with therapy interruption sequences or how do they align with uh, life of a woman that wants to be pregnant, you know, uh, and, and start a family. So, the, so it's not going to be the answer to everything, but it's certainly going to change the way we, we think about options, I think. Right. We're not going to be able to do... Uh, treatment interruptions in the same way, definitely. That's one thing that would be affected. If it's a year-long treatment, they're not going to be able to necessarily join a study that's requiring them to go off therapy until their therapy wears out for that year. Right. Like that, that, that'll be definitely a wrinkle. Um, did Anne or Brad want to add anything? I'll just say that for in terms of the um, you know the long-acting therapies that we have in hand now, the um, injectable cabotegravir and rilpivirine combination that's FDA approved, there was data um, that was presented, saying you know showing that basically every four weeks seems to be or giving it every eight weeks rather than four weeks is non-inferior, and I think that's already been pretty much known from prior studies, but it wasn't FDA approved for the every four weeks, so now at least it probably will be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's getting, you know, we're not at the year in terms of actually clinically available drugs yet, but it, we're getting, you know, a little bit closer. And the every eight weeks has been submitted to the FDA for approval. Okay, I didn't know that, that's good. Um, so, go ahead, did, did you, who was there? Sorry. Linda has a quick question, her hand is raised. Okay, go ahead. Linda, please come off. Sorry, mute. yeah, I had to unmute. Um, you know, but that's really not, those long acting drugs are really not cures, you know, that where you, where you won't be doing, I mean, unless you have really, you know, Visconti type uh, exceptional data. I mean, they're not really about cures. People- a Absolutely, Linda, I agree year, with you. They'll still have to do that, you know? And I mean, if you think about uh, the people in Africa that are still getting, you know, drugs like uh, that we had 15 years ago. I mean, I think that's a, that remains a huge issue. What we'd like to do is make sure, um, you know, that eventually you'll have some sort of a, of, 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 a, of a cure as opposed to not. Right. And I, I mean, and they're more about ease of administration and, um, and adherence, I think. And the other thing is, as, uh, as was said, I mean, you have to see your doctor once a month. So most people go in every six months or, or you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so think if you, were, you had a practice and all of a sudden half of your, um, your, uh, your, your patients had to see you once a month as opposed to once every six months. I mean, who's gonna, that's a pretty big lift for most physicians and practices. Right. And as someone pointed out in the chat, the injectables still will have side effects that they're gonna have to deal with coming off of them or how do you switch? Uh, you know, like that's gonna be another issue. There's gonna be lots of issues besides that clinical issue of if everybody's on this, you're gonna to have to change the way clinics operate because people are gonna be coming into the clinic a heck of a lot more. And I think that is definitely something that I know uh, in Seattle they are thinking about and how are they going to do that? But also remember 
the research is always trying to improve itself. I think hopefully we're going to go for subcutaneous, maybe self injections, you know, so people mm. won't eventually have to come into the clinic. I think that's where the lung acting injectables are moving towards, you know, where we can have people go in less frequently, but collect a bunch of uh, medicine and have a bunch of needles and be more like uh, the insulin treatments that my friend with type one diabetes might have to take, um, you know, making HIV like that type of treatment. So you there's a lot of oral drugs too in the pipeline to do yeah. the same thing. So, and I think as Luis was saying, the question will be, do we need to spend all this money on cure research if we can have drugs that we only need to take once a year? Which we're we're pretty far away from that at this juncture, but I mean, you know, once there's once drugs start to roll out, they speed up things. You know, these things tend to speed up pretty quickly once they figure out certain things. It's wow. not like us that we, the more yeah. we do, the more questions we have. I would love to ask the other people attending this call right now. What do you think? <laughs> um, what, what do you think about this issue? Uh, speak up. Uh, I would love to hear what you are thinking. Um, what if we have a pill that you have to take once a year? Would you still want to see a cure? Uh, you, Richard Jeffries in the chat says yes. Could Let me add, as that? somebody who went in for weekly allergy shots, uh, it's a real system. I, I went in and I was out of the office within five minutes for my weekly allergy shots. Wow. So clinics, you're not going to see a doctor. You're going to go in, you're going to see an RN, right. you're going to get a shot, you're going to be gone in five minutes. So this is going to be very fast. It's not going to be a burden for any of the doctors, trust me. Right. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Yes. And I see a lot of people saying, yes, absolutely. Yes. So, in the irony, the, not the irony, but the, the, the complexity is that, as you know, cure-related research requires really high levels of commitment of an understanding of what the entire objectives of these studies are trying to accomplish. And the same individuals that are the most informed and most committed are probably the ones that are also most aware of what developments are for new therapies. So the question would be how many of these in individuals will transition into long-term art and that are the same type of groups that we kind of have been working with towards a cure agenda uh, because you know, these studies are, are very demanding. So it really requires someone to be very invested in, in the cure agenda. Mm. But they're also very informed at the same time. Right. Mm. I'm reading a lot of the responses. Thank you for giving us your thoughts here. This is really appreciated um, because we wonder about these things. I often wonder how it will affect the advocacy around the cure. Will there still be a push or a need? And I think that's why it's important for us to get a global perspective in um, and making sure that community from everywhere, not just the US or not just from Europe or not just from Australia, but everywhere. So we can have a more robust response to that type of question because we might get content with ourselves um, in you know, high income countries um, that might have uh, good healthcare, but there's still a lot of people who don't even have access yet to regular ART. Right. You know, and we right. still need to take care of that before we can even ever let go of a cure. And they're the people online always that I hear clamoring for a cure, crying out every day, cure us, cure us, cure us. I am, I think I saw Josephine sign on. Josephine, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, welcome. Glad you could make it. I wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us a little about yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My name is Josephine of Kenya. I work in Kampala, Uganda at Macquarie University, Johns Hopkins Research Collaboration, and I'm an HIV cure fellow. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Um, Josephine, Thank did you get to attend CROI? Unfortunately, I didn't attend CROI, okay. but uh, today I tried to watch some of the videos uh -huh. that were showing certain presentations of, uh, that were done during the meeting. Well, that's great. And so what we've been talking about right now is uh, bringing up uh, the global need for a cure and how long uh, acting treatment might affect people's desire. And we were looking for people's expression of what they thought about the two. Um, would they still want to cure if they could take a pill once a year for treatment? 
Well, I think uh, the view may vary from different people to the other. I, I think when, when, when I give an example of my mother who started ARVs when there was no ARVs, you know, you know that moment when there's no treatment and then it comes and you're all just happy to get the treatment. So to such people that were taking very many pills and now modifications have happened that they're taking lesser pills and probably the injection is coming, you know, to those, it may look like, you know, we are better off right now. But to the younger generation, I don't think that would be the case. Like, um, even if you take me off two pills and you give me one pill a month or one pill in six months, mm. trust me, from my personal experience, I would still demand the cure because there is so much more associated to HIV than just the pills that we take. The, you know, the long time side effects, uh, the fact that, you, you know, even if it is one pill, you will still have to take that one pill. So there is so much the stigma around it. So there's so much beyond the medication that we're taking. So I would still demand for HIV cure personally. And many feel the same way, I think. Stigma mm -hmm. is the overriding monster everyone found it affects everyone whether you live with hiv or you don't everyone is affected by hiv stigma and it makes life living hell for some people um it, it's what i believe gives people um a platform online to sell fake hiv cures um it's all that stigma people who are feeling desperate will do desperate things and be willing to pay for anything and uh, that always breaks my heart when i see that happening um uh Go on, I want to give Danielle a chance to ask a question or two or direct us somewhere. Uh, I'd wanted to be sure that we address Linda. Linda, sure. do you still have your hand up? Or did you have something additional to say? Sorry, no, no, no. I uh, have to just put it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, as I peruse the, the chat here, um, lots of support for an HIV cure, however, yeah, well, we had a lot of questions about earlier on about cutting HIV out of the cells with CRISPR and mm -hmm. um, asking questions you. about that and uh, the work that's been done of uh, excising HIV from the DNA. Um, was there anything related to that or the work that's going on in Temple at Croy? That's for any of y'all. <laughs> I don't think I saw any, uh, any updates to that at Croy. Yeah, I didn't. I did. No, there was, I didn't see it either. Um, do you know of anything that might be happening? <laughs> if it wasn't at Croy, we don't have to limit ourselves to Croy. This is also about right. where we are at, at the level of, uh, of uh, achievement in 2021, just in general. So we're not just limited to Croy. Um, I know I saw a press release recently, but I, I wasn't going to mention that. And, and people, yeah. were, go ahead. I think a human trial is being planned. Um, and, and I think it will involve using the uh, a somewhat similar uh, approach to the one Anne talked about earlier with an AAV adeno associated virus vector to deliver this kind of cutting mechanism into the body if, if, if the regulators and the FDA will, will give permission for that to happen. Hmm. Well, I had a question about something that I've gotten from Croy. Now, of course, I used to be able to follow Croy without actually having to attend because they did such a good job of posting the talks that I could almost follow along at a slower pace, maybe, but it was great. And this year I feel cut off and I feel like I'm back in the old days where only the priests learned Latin and only the priests could read the Bible. <laughs> and we're waiting for the priests to tell us what to think and all that. But I hear about these HTI vaccines the vaccines and can you speak to that a little bit what might have been talked about at the conference and what they are these therapeutic vaccines do you know what i'm talking about yeah i saw this is a talk a late breaker i think from uh, beatrice um most or most i'm not sure how you pronounce it um and it was a um a phase one, two placebo controlled trial. And I had to look up what HTI stood for actually just before this too, because I was, I, I couldn't remember. So it's, it's basically um, there, it's a viral vector immunogen, but the insert, the HIV insert is um, 
basically a um, it's derived from over 50 um, epitopes, T cell epitopes targeting both for both CD4 and CD8 T cells that are um, what they say restricted by a wide range of, of HLA types, which means that hopefully a lot, it would be beneficial for a lot of different people from different genetic backgrounds. Um, and if those epitopes are relatively conserved so that if one of them is mutated, it's associated with a big fitness cost for the virus. So most likely, you know, most, the idea is to have sort of a broad consensus um, type of uh, sequence so that you, the T cells that are generated that are specific for HIV by this vaccine would be most likely to be targeting the infecting virus or the viruses that are in, uh, you know, uh, the reservoir. And so what they did is they, it's a really complicated vaccine regimen. So they had, um, it's three, uh, just DN straight up DNA uh, vac immunizations, two MVA with this HTI insert, two uh, Chad Ox, so the um, chimp adenovirus vector that also is used in the COVID vaccines. Uh, and then a, followed by one more MPA. So it's really very, you know, a lot, a long number, a, lot, a large number of um, immunizations. And then there was a treatment interruption as a part of the trial. And um, they said it was safe, well tolerated, had, did induce um, strong immune responses. Um, and in terms of the kind of main readout, which was uh, time to viral rebound and rebound set point, um, in this 24 week treatment interruption period. The time to rebound didn't really differ, but they did claim a kind of reduction in viral, they didn't really say it this way, but it, that's how the graph looks as a reduction in viral set point in the folks who got the vaccine regimen compared to the placebos. And um, what it really was is that fewer of those folks who got the vaccine regimen ended up going back, meet, meeting their art restart criteria that they had specified. But they definitely all rebounded and had, you know, kind of varying levels of, of viremia during that period of time. So I think it was, you know, favorable, maybe sort of um, keeping the hope alive for a therapeutic vaccine approach, but it wasn't a, you know, a sort of slam dunk, I would say. And, and they did mention there's another trial that is doing the same vaccine regimen and then it's combined with the TLR7 agonist to maybe induce more antigen expression. So the T cells that they are generating with the vaccine have more of an effect on the viral reservoir, although Brad may disagree with that. <laughs> well, this seems to be at least the first I can recall that a therapeutic vaccine for HIV has had any sort of effect that was a positive step forward. Is that? A fair assessment. I mean, I, it's the first time I've heard something where it's like, oh, this actually worked. Usually it's like they've tried it and it was well tolerated, but it didn't really do anything. This was at least doing something. That's a great point, Michael. I'll just say there, there was a, there was a, I can't remember the um, authors or anything, but there was a dendritic cell based vaccine that um, reported a reduction in viral load. Uh, I can send around that, that link if I can find it as well. As I think that's one um, previous precedent. And just to mention the HTI approach, there is also a group uh, testing that in a dendritic cell platform that's um, out of University of Pittsburgh, a trial called DCO4, um, just, as a, just as another example of what's out there. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, the issue with therapeutic vaccines still remains that the alternative is full suppression on ART. So therefore, the appetite to keep a viral replication going to a lesser degree than those that did not get a vaccine. Scientifically, it's interesting, but operationally, is dead because you can be on therapy. Uh, so, so as opposed to keep a viral load of twenty thousand rather than fifty thousand or sixty thousand. So, from a again from a scientific perspective, it gives us uh, an insight into what may be components that we can build upon. But that's a far cry from saying that we have a strategy that would replace antiretroviral therapy. That's a great point. Yeah, I think that is a really good point, 
but I think it's probably true for pretty much, you know, maybe except for the CRISPR approach, but for almost everything that we have right now is that, you know, we might need to start thinking about successive strategies. So something that's not completely successful in preventing rebound or causing remission, but has a, you know, partial effect, then, you know, an individual might go back on antiretroviral therapy and then have another uh, intervention approach, you know, either the same one or a different one. And sort of, it may be sort of this successive approach kind of eventually you get down to that um, level where the virus can no longer be. Mm. Um, and so we had a follow-up question specific to Brad. Brad, you mentioned the dendritic cell platforms um, and people are asking, why does this matter? How is this distinctive from the platform in the HTI vaccine? Um, can you yeah, tell thanks. I was just uh, typing an answer, but I'll, I'll verbally give an answer as well. So, so dendritic cells, these are the cells in your body that um, have the job of, of initiating an immune response, initiating uh, a response to a virus, for example. So they're very powerful at doing that. So the dendritic cell approach um, is kind of a custom approach. It involves a leukophoresis from the study participant. It then isolates these powerful um, immune initiators, these dendritic cells from these people, and then gives them these targeted regions of the virus that we think are vulnerable, these HTI regions, and then puts those cells back into the study participant. And so that primes really a, a particularly strong uh, immune response in some, in some cases. It depends a bit on, on, on the details, but in some cases it's very powerful. Um, so that's, that has advantages and disadvantages versus viral vectored approaches. Um, which is the other type of vaccine that, um, that we were discussing. So in viral vector approaches, you, you, you have the same vaccine, you can give it to everyone. And in some cases it primes a strong immune response uh, also, but there are um, differences in the flavor of that immune response. And we don't fully understand what it is that is needed to make the immune response effective but we see that bit of a signal with it, with the dendritic cell studies. And so that's why we kind of want to follow that forward and see if we can improve upon that um, further. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you all, uh, one of my favorite parts of any conference is all the posters. And just because I always think about the case of Timothy Ray Brown, that it was first introduced to the world on a I'm gonna call it a lousy looking poster. It was just a typical poster that if you don't understand science, you would just walk by it and not even realize what it was. And I think a lot of people didn't really catch it at first that way. But um, with the poster selection this year, is there anything that you found that stood out? Do you have a favorite poster that uh, had some impact on your, your thinking or your work or your ideas about cure? So there was a poster from the Oxford group that looked at the correlates of uh, lack of rebound on treatment interruption. And, and there was actually quite a bit on this theme in the conference as well, as far as biomarkers and, 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 and products that could be measured that would be predictive of what would happen. And um, so they basically described that if you have a particular gene signature that you would have a predicted longer period of uh, lack of viral return. So that's kind of cool. But the intriguing part is that the signature was related to a, a particular program of interferon mediated regulation, which is this sort of response of your innate immune system that you would be engaging. Now, the reason it's intriguing is that we also had another presentation from a, 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 another group that basically were describing how this same type of signature, if it's present during the viral rebound, basically allows the virus to break through it, meaning that it's not gonna stop it. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, how come the signature on antiretroviral therapy would predict longer time if this other work is showing that the virus can break through that without any problem. Because you would argue that it wouldn't necessarily be the breaks, right? So, 
So the, the reason I thought that was interesting is that when you think about this gene signature, you can think of it in two ways. One is what it's doing to the cell that is being infected. And the other is what it's doing to the immune system. Mm. And if you just look at it from the point of view of the cell that it is being infected, then the other work says there's no nothing to gain here because they're showing the virus can break through, that it can infect the cell in spite of this particular program. Mm. But if you look at it from the immune side, then you would argue, is this program making the immune system more powerful, even if the virus can break through it anyway, if it was to infect the cell without an immune system? So, and the reason that's kind of cool is that a lot of the cure strategies are looking to modulate the immune system directly, not necessarily the cell that is being infected. Right. So, so this would suggest that there is hope in strategies that are looking to promote this type of response going into a treatment interruption if we kind of put the two studies together. And this was a poster from a group at Oxford that described that. Hmm. Great. Um, Anne, how about you? Any posters you want to care? Tell me about? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the way they did the posters was actually kind of nice. They, they called them science spotlights and basically people got about five minutes to talk through them. So they were sort of like mini talks um, in a way. Um, so I guess one, I mean, there, there were a lot, I mean, I think a lot of the science was presented as, as spotlights here, but, um, one that I thought was interesting, that's not, uh, sort of directly cure related, I suppose, but has some relevance is that, um, there was a study from, um, Allison Thomas at Boston University School of Medicine. And they were looking at um, a type of antibody response called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity in, um, in infants who were um, HIV exposed but uninfected compared to HIV exposed and infected. Um, and they found that the uninfected infants had much higher levels of um, anti a this ADCC activity uh, than the infected infants. Now, of course, they can't prove that having higher levels of ADCC um, protected those uninfected infants, but it's kind of intriguing. Um, and the, they, then for the babies who were infected, they segregated them into those that had high ADCC and those that had low ADCC. And the ones that had the higher levels had um, kind of better outcomes, so fewer kind of adverse events and, and less death um, was associated. And these are kind of old samples that were stored from the, what's something called the BAN study that was actually looking at kind of breastfeeding um, in terms of transmission. But that was interesting because um, it, we have a study from my group that was um, presented as a, uh, partially presented as an oral abstract and then partially presented as a science spotlight where we have a group of um, infant rhesus macaques that were infected with um, simian human immunodeficiency virus. And they, we infected them at multiple different time points, or no, we infected them sort of around four weeks of age. And then we started antiretroviral therapy at multiple different time points. So uh, very early, just within a few days after infection, a couple of weeks after infection, and then two months after infection. And so there was no additional intervention. The idea was to kind of um, treat them for a year and then interrupt therapy and allow for rebound to occur so, so that we could have um, varying times to rebound, varying post-treatment control and could try to generate an, like sort of a whole uh, biomarker stew that we could use to predict sort of what are those rebound characteristics. And the whole idea of this is that you could use um, the, inf the information that we're getting from the non-human primate model to try to inform when it would be safe and appropriate to do treatment interruption in children um, mm -hmm. in your trial. So that's the whole idea behind the study in the first place. And, but one of the things that we found, and it's just an N of one monkey for now, so it's not something that, you know, we are, you know, we need to definitely see if it's, if it's relevant in other cohorts, but we had one animal that uh, did not rebound. Mm. And the strongest predictor of that was um, autologous uh, 
antibody responses that developed while the animal was on antiretroviral therapy. Um, and they were neutralizing for that animal's own virus um, and we're looking into other antibody functions like ADCC in this animal as well. So it seems like maybe the humoral immunity is playing a role um, and, and that's been, so there's some other evidence I think from Janet Silicano presented at uh, the Strategies for a Cure meeting, um, some information about autologous neutralizing antibodies and, and their role in, in rebound as well. So that's sort of um, something that we're pursuing. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mark, I see that you have your hand raised, um, but I wanted to give Lewis a chance to respond to my poster question first. So if you could hold tight, we'll get Lewis to talk and then Mark will get your question, okay? So Lewis. Oh, I did. I, I told about oh, the did. Oxford, Oxford oh, poster. Uh, Brad, I'm sorry. Brad, I messed up. <laughs> Brad it's you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, okay. so hello. Um, so I agree, the poster sessions were really interesting. Actually, a lot of the things that I highlighted so far were from the science spotlights or, or posters, but I'll highlight um, one more that I thought was pretty neat. This was from Nicholas Chamont's group, um, which presented a test of this, uh, this so-called fill and replace strategy to reduce the reservoir. And the idea here is that you use a growth factor to stimulate um, the thymus to make new T cells. So the thymus is the organ in the body that makes T cells. So you can just essentially, the idea is make new T cells. They're not infected. They don't have a reservoir. And this just kind of pushes the other, the other uh, T cells out of the way over, over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they report that when they give this, this was a, a, a trial, a clinical trial, they report that when they, they give this growth factor, they do see evidence for an increase in new T cells. And as a result of this, there is a, a modest but statistically significant decrease in the frequency of cells with HIV DNA. So, so uh, a, a, a small proportional reduction in the reservoir, 0.8 fold uh, change. So I think, you know, early, early days for this strategy, but uh, kind of neat and something to uh, keep an eye on. Wow, that's cool. Thank you. And uh, if you didn't see in the chat there, Richard Jeffries was informing us that the Croy Conference has trademarked science spotlights. Hmm. I know. That's uh, interesting news. I just thought that would, I would point that out <laughs> to people if they hadn't seen it. <laughs> Definitely worth highlighting. Mark, you had your question I wanted to get to. Yeah, it's about uh, T regulatory cells being, oh. you know, uh, oh, always. Sorry. Sorry. Not, not Wagner. Sorry. But Sorry, go Wagner. Ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Wagner. Well, have you go. I was talking to Mark Milano. I didn't realize we had two Marks. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mark That's Wagner, on. take it. And then Mark Milano will have you come next. We yeah. promise. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, two regulatory cells are, are known to be a um, uh, site of um, you know, uh, persistence in HIV. And likely those cells are going to be more resistant to uh, cell death. So is there any more thoughts on what direction the Tregs are going to play in the role of cure research? Mm, great question. Who wants to try and respond first? Please come off mute. It, it is a great question. I wish I knew more. I should know more on the topic, but I, I don't know so much. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 as you know, Mark, the Treg uh, area at the beginning was uh, there was a lot of hope that there was a real relationship between viremia or control or immune response and the levels of T-Rex because T-Rex can go up with uh, an infection status. But a lot of that data didn't really provide a clear correlate uh, regarding the direction and the frequency by which the amount of control or immune response could be predicted by the levels of T-Rex in a person. Now, I think there is still a lot of um, interest in releasing the uh, inhibition, but most of that interest has actually centered around checkpoint inhibitors, you know, as opposed to T-Rex, kind of like releasing the negative signals that may be coming directly to a T-cell. And there was even a presentation still this year about the anti-PD-1, and they, I know that there are uh, ongoing work on other negative checkpoints as well. So I would say that if you think about the T-Rex as a negative regulation on, on the immune response, that what we're seeing more is the trying to use these anti-cancer strategies that have 
developed antibodies to target specific molecules more than targeting an entire cell. Yeah, but if the T regulatory cells themselves can get um, infected and basically be perhaps resistant to apoptosis, would that you know present a, a greater challenge to a cure strategy? Yeah, I mean, I just don't know the data that supports that a T reg would be resistant to apoptosis and enrich itself in the presence of viral replication because you're suggesting that a cell can be infected, be activated, and it's not going to be expressing the virus nor dying. Uh, and so it would basically expand itself preferentially while at the same time being infected. I mean, we know about the clonal expansion and that it can occur, but whether but there's no data linking clonal expansion to T-reg phenotypes directly, meaning that every time we see a clonal expansion is a T-reg. Uh, so, so that part, I think we, we don't necessarily, I don't know of any data that can say, okay, well, the T-Rec is responsible for immunosuppression based on the expansion of infected cells that don't die. That I'm not aware of. Okay. And, uh, Mark Milano, sorry for the mess up, but, uh, did you want to ask your question now? Sure. Thanks. I just wanted to ask if there was any, uh, has been any development at CORE or anywhere else on a problem that comes up in my HIV workshops over and over and over again. And that is that subpopulation of people who have been undetectable for years and cannot get their CD4 counts above 200. Uh, I always, we always say just wait and wait, but there are, is there any movement on raising CD4 counts when you're chronically undetectable and any, any hope for these people who cannot, it's really tough because they're at risk for all these OIs, even though they've been virally suppressed for years. Are we seeing any talk about that? What can they do? Great question. Thanks, Mark. Any of our panelists want to chime in and respond here? And then Michael posted in the I chat, immunologic non-responders is what Mark is referring to in his question. And I thought in Case Western, they were actually kind of looking at gene therapy approach to help with that since um, they were seeing some sort of a benefit from the early Sangamo trials, but I don't know if that trial is currently ongoing. Richard, do you there's, know? There's long-term, this is Matt Sharp, there's long-term follow-up uh, in the early Sangamo trial, but the company refused to do any further research. Mm. Yeah, there was so a... a the NIH had given some money to look at a, a um, another trial, a second trial, but I, I think that trial, because of COVID, just completely died. Hmm. Okay. But that was the. And Simon posted in the chat about from some Fostemzavir upcoming studies for low CD4 folks. And I think I think there might be one that one remaining Sangamo study. I, I'm not 100% sure if it, but it but it was listed as still ongoing in Cleveland, mm. um, where where, but it wasn't really focused on people with low CD4 counts, um, and yeah. it, and it is an area where there hasn't really been you know there's been there was some activist sort of activity trying to encourage mm -hmm. development of adjunct therapies. Um, that wasn't really all that successful. Our IL-7 was studied for a while, but then the company developing it went bankrupt. Um, there was a study from the FDA at Croy last year trying to see if there was kind of endpoints that could be used as surrogate endpoints for, for this type of um, treatment study, and they didn't really have much success. So really to prove a benefit, you'd have to do very large trials that would look at uh, clinical endpoints mm. and so it's a difficult area to encourage industry to engage in there was just a meta-analysis of studies published which found kind of as we know that nobody's really seen a, any particular effect with anything and I, I can post the link to that in in the chat but it's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on and, and still trying to encourage uh, more studies of bob bucklew's just reminded us the name of the study is trailblazer i knew it had mm. a name Thank you uh, for that. And he says that it is uh, restarted. So, and it's, uh, but it's not looking at folks with compromised immune systems. So 
Thanks for that update. Um, Bob. And I see Simon has his hand raised. Simon, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, so the, the phase three studies with just stem severe um, produced um, CD4 counts that you haven't seen with any other drugs. So, so I think that's worth looking at. You know, people who people who started there with really low CD4 counts, even you know, irrespective of their response to to treatment, they got good. You know, a lot of people bounced back over to 200 again, and so there's a signal there that there might be something different. And certainly, in terms of research, uh, you know, research studies coming up, I'd check B for for stem severe. And are they I doing studies? Yeah, I'm not sure how far they've been planned. Are, are they doing studies? Are they doing studies specifically in non-responders? Yeah. Great, that's wonderful, thanks. Awesome, thank you for that. And then Richard posted some stuff in the, oh, oh um, Simon, can you raise, um, drop your hand, I'm sorry, so that we uh, come back to you with no question. Um, so we have about a half hour left uh, before we end this call. And I wanted to sort of broaden our talk beyond Croy a little bit. And I really wanted to ask our four uh, guests you know, what should we be paying attention to in terms of HIV cure in the coming years? So like, let's give it a five year span. What do you think we should be focusing on um, as community members um, when it comes to HIV cure? What should we keep our ears peeled for, so to speak? Um, so why don't we start with ooh, random selection, Anne. Uh, well, I, I think it's, um, we're poised to have a lot of excitement come out in the next five years. Um, I mean, I think everybody on this call knows that there um, is there are so the recompetition for the Martin Delaney collaboratories. Um, so those will be reviewed very soon. Um, and one very exciting thing, I don't know if everybody is aware, but there was a specific call for a pediatric focused Martin Delaney collaboratory this year, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so hope <laughs> I like all the celebrations. So, um, you know, regardless of, of who gets that, there will be a lot of exciting research that comes out from that. Um, and I think, you know, just all of the efforts to apply the cutting edge techniques that are being developed to understanding the um, reservoir in perinatally infected children um, and adolescents is is really, uh, it's gonna be very exciting to see where that takes us. And then um, of course, uh, where my heart is, is to really try to push the envelope in the infant non-human primates to try, you know, th try a bunch of different things and different approaches and see if we get any signals of efficacy and obviously safety. And then to kind of move forward with those in um, human clinical trials, I think, you know, many people who are involved in planning clinical trials in adults, you know, I've heard again and again that there's not really a um, kind of, you don't need to have a, a non-human primate safety study first before moving forward, depending on what the product is, obviously. But um, in pediatrics, there is much more uh, reticence to, to new novel interventions that haven't been tried first, either in adults or in uh, non-human primates. And so that's what we're really trying to do is test, you know, things that we can do when uh, art is initiated because we have kind of more uh, ready access to infants soon after birth. So we can add on things in addition to very early art, um, but also not lose sight of all of the uh, perinatally infected school age, adolescent, and even you know younger young adults that are out there right now living with HIV that also demand a cure too. So we're tr in in at least in our approach would be to try to focus on all of those different groups. Thank you for that. There's a related question posted in the chat after you all make your way through responses to Michael's question. Sure. So uh, why don't we have Luis? So I mean I think in the most immediate future. The, the thing to look forward to is the rebound of all the trials that were affected by COVID and that we will then move forward. I think it was a lot of the research activity that got hit uh, last year uh, that is hoping to uh, recover and move forward this year. So I think we're going to see a lot more trial outcomes next year than we did this year uh, in the short term. Um, I think from a, from a scientific 
point of view, as we talked about earlier, this whole idea of how best to be measuring strategies by what they're doing to the reservoir and taking advantage of these new predictors for rebound would be the two tools that are in our kits now that moving forward would be of interest to to use and, and, and exploit. But I think from an activist point of view, I think, uh, you know, we'll take care of the science. What you need to take care of is that NIH doesn't lose the eye on the ball. And I believe that, you know, they're now talking about getting rid of the UO1s uh, as trial independence of the ACTG and how there may be merging trial structures into the ACTG to try to come up with hybrid, you know, types of settings, which is great because we talked about that before, right? How the ACTG should reach out more to outside people from the ACTG, but securing that they create a structure that protects resources that could be accessed by the outside folks. Uh, I think it's, it's going to make sure that we have a very uh, uh, diverse effort nationally. Uh, and so I think that's one area that, that I would um, encourage you to learn more about. And, and, and the, the letter for the fetal band lifting was sent. So we're all waiting to see whether the Biden administration is going to do something about that. But I think that from a cure perspective, that was really an important step. Uh, and following up on that as to what's going on would be useful for the research effort. Uh, and then I've also talked about before centralizing some of these high cost technologies like uh, to make them more accessible to research programs like uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, CARE and HLA typing. Uh, there's a series of very core types of resources that are highly specialized, very costly, and would take huge chunks out of our grants if we put them in. But we would be so much better if we had access to them. And, and uh, so pushing those for greater access would, would be great. Thank you. And uh, Professor Jones. Yeah, so there's, there's three areas I would highlight. Um, on the clinical trials front, there's a lot of activities that, as Lewis nicely put it, are going to be um, taken off the ice and moving, moving forwards. Um, there's several studies that combine broadly neutralizing antibodies with immunomodulatory agents, be they TLR7 agonists or IL-15 super agonists, um, that I think we should keep an eye on. I think there's reason to be cautiously optimistic on the basis of results from non-human primate studies with these same combinations where um, some of the animals have gone into long-term remission. Uh, on the other hand, as Lewis also pointed out, there was a, a poster from Croy with uh, treatment with two BNABs in, in early infection that differed from the previous results with other antibodies from Malcolm Martin. So, um, so that's a bit of a note of caution, but there are several reasonably sized studies moving forward in people soon. And, um, and I'm gonna be keeping a close eye on those for sure. In terms of the more basic science, uh, yeah, I, I really want to know what's what's going on with uh, with this uh, this active reservoir that is is getting a lot more attention from a number of different fronts. So I think it's we we know now that the reservoir doesn't simply hide from the immune system. It's more complicated than that, and any clues that we can learn regarding how or why that's happening, I think, is going to open up new therapeutic fronts. Um, and then the third thing I would highlight is that I really hope in the next few years we see a lot more activity towards working with non-subtype B virus and reservoirs and, um, and, and, and looking at cure from a more globally diverse perspective. So a lot of the new assays that have been developed, in particular, I would highlight the, the IPDA, have the potential to be more scalable and usable in, 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 in um, less resource intensive ways. Um, but there's work to be done to make those assays work with the types of virus that are circulating in places other than North America and Europe. And I think that by extending those studies, not only 
will we set the stage for more equitable interventions when they come around? But also, I think there's going to be differences in the way the reservoir behaves in different populations and different subtypes. And having those diverse perspectives might lead us to some fundamental insights about um, how HIV persists in a really general sense. Mm. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. A couple questions in the chat. But before we get to the questions, Linda D, really quick, your question. I wanted to say to Luis that I'm sure the fetal tissue stuff that they'll let us know as soon as they hear something, you know, the organizers of that letter. And I think that what the what they're doing with the ACTG is to allow for the stuff that we talked about. I think I talked to Carl about that, um, you know, allow for some more money for for the needs of, of, for instance, the MDC working with the ACTG. But I wanted to know what you what you, um, I mean, did you, you said you are ones, right? Not our ones. I mean, they're still, right? Yeah. What, yeah. what did you say, Luis, about what's going to disappear? There's been, you know, in the trial development platforms that are available through grants, the U01 is called a cooperative agreement, meaning that right. it's, and, uh, and it's the same magnitude of funding as an R1, except that an R1 is you have a principal investigator driving the research. Right. In, a, in a U01, there is more involvement from NIH program in the team, like a trial would require. So that if you if you have a trial concept, then you would submit a U01 in order to get it done. Now the question is, when it comes to the cure agenda. Are they going to say you can only do them in the ACTG through this new structure? Or are they going to allow both of these to coexist? I would argue that until they show that the ACTG is not going to be a closed shop in spite of how they design it, that the U01 is still a good way to keep diversity in the pipeline. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll find out. Thank you for that. And then just a follow-up question for you, Luis. Uh, there was a question posted in the chat. How's your BNAB interferon trial going? Did COVID cause any delays? That was a plant? No, no, I, 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 uh, just, that's funny. No, 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 no. It's like, but in all seriousness, it's going very well. <clears throat> At first we were very scared that the COVID was gonna basically shut it down, but we've been able to recruit uh, since June and uh, we hope to make full recruitment by the summer. Uh, and so far, you know, things are going very well. Uh, there's a whole period of six months that individuals are taking both interferon and BNAPs. And the, exp and the expectation from Marina's uh, BNAP studies from Rockefeller is usually around 60% or 40 to 60% suppression that could be maintained. And now, those studies did not select people for sensitivity for the antibodies, right? They basically were all comers coming in. We were one of the first studies to actually select sensitivity at the beginning, meaning that we knew that the individuals were carrying reservoirs that were sensitive to the antibodies that were going to be given. And up to now, uh, of, I think of everyone that's been recruited, pretty much everyone has remained suppressed. So which it's become now a question of, is it the addition of the interferon or was it the uh, fact that they were all sensitive uh, to begin with? Mm -hmm. And so we're now recruiting the BNAP only arm in order to answer that question. Now, all, all of them will have an open-ended interruption coming up. So we're still going to be able to ask the question, did this make any difference? or this was just a replacement of art, or did we actually go beyond that? And, uh, but I think even if it's a replacement of art, it's still gonna be kind of cool because it will be the first study that ties the sensitivity to the outcome of suppression. If we are lucky and there's an impact beyond that, then obviously that would be awesome, but we'll have to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, now this study, as you know, also introduced uh, accept, uh, participant experience questionnaires at the beginning and end. Uh, that Kareem Dubais has been involved and Chris and others as well from our cap. Uh, and the, and they also includes a viral load, uh, at home viral load study as well, uh, that's been tested 
in this particular platform. So we're basically getting three studies for the price of one, if you like, because we're getting the social science agenda, the home bar load testing, and the actual strategy itself, both in the context of art, which is one answer, or in the context of an open ended interruption, which is a second answer. So I think we'll, we'll be able to get some, mm -hmm. hopefully some useful information out of this. Well, and I guess in maybe three or four years from now, you're going to rule the conference setting because you're going to have all these studies releasing their data. And uh, I wouldn't go well, that far, but but let's just hope that we have a poster or two. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of uh, sculpt us towards an ending here. I wanted to hear from the researchers. Um, how best might community members support Cure Research in the you know next five years? And then I'm going to ask the community here. I want to ask. What do you guys need from the researchers to help you do work in Cure? What is it that you're going to need from them? So it's kind of taking both of those. So how can we the cure, uh, community help the researchers? And then community, what do you need from researchers? Lots of questions. Yes. I will just say very briefly, I think it was kind of already said, but to, uh, and it, it's been very evident in the chat, you know, as we've been going through, but to keep demanding a cure and putting yep. the pressure on us and the pressure on that, you know, us scientists, you know, and the pressure on the NIH to fund it. Thank you. Next. Um, I, I would, I would suggest, you know, I think there's really, um, I, I hope there's going to be a groundswell of enthusiasm for virology and viral immunology amongst young people that is uh, instigated, of course, by the COVID pandemic. And I hope that in, in part of that, we can attract new talent and, and, and new young minds to the HIV field as well to continue to contribute to HIV cure. Um, and one thing that I've seen is that for people who are uh, junior in the lab, they really get excited when they have a chance to meet with uh, the community and, and share their research with the people who are directly affected by these things. So I think the more opportunities we have to nurture and, and foster that enthusiasm, um, the better we'll set the stage for the future in our field because funding, of course, is always uh, a limitation. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that I find a limitation more and more is you know the ability to to recruit postdocs in the lab, um, and so I think we do, we do need to uh, uh, to make sure we continue to have that uh, that pipeline being being refreshed. Thank you. We want to take care to include diversity considerations in that as well. You talk about the pipeline, right? Absolutely. Okie doke. Um, others want to weigh in. We have uh, lots going on in the chat box. We'd like to discuss as well. Um, I think both, I think both offices are extremely mm. useful because, um, okay. uh, how about we go, we can get Linda and then Mark Milano mm -hmm. to answer your question. So Linda, why don't you go first? Yeah, you know, I think it would be really helpful, um, if the docs would share and discuss their, um, protocols and informed consent forms with their community advisory boards. And, and I imagine that most of you probably already do that. But I think it's, um, I mean, I mean, we do that extensively with DARE. I mean, we spend a lot of time, you know, playing with informed consents, talking about inclusion, exclusion criteria and, and just toxicity issues and stuff like that. And, and as we do that, it really helps inform community advisory board members who can in turn take it back to their communities, so it's a, it's very helpful, and I think um, um, not only us learning and being able to um, um, you know send that you know like give that learning to other people, but also for the PIs to um, have a, a better, more patient friendly protocol. Mm. So I think that's really important, and I love doing this. I mean, I think um, you know it's one thing to hear a presentation if you're a community member; it's another thing to hear. To be able to ask questions, it's just as like a flower blooming. I mean, you get so much more information and you learn things that um, that you just didn't know from just hearing a presentation. So thank you all. It's really very important. Thank you. And Mark, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I, I'm curious to bounce something off. One of the most important things we can take from webinars like this is how to 
disseminate this information. Mm -hmm. So I'm an HIV educator and, you know, I hear constantly that the cure exists and is being hidden and Magic Johnson has been cured. We all hear that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time explaining why that is not the case. And I also explain the big question is, why is there no cure 40 years later? And I just want to bounce off with you uh, the way I explain the reservoir and see if this is the best way to do it if you have other ideas on how to explain the reservoir to somebody who is coming at this cold. I explained what a resting memory CD4 cell is. I explained that one in a million has HIV. And I basically say the reason we can't get rid of that is because they are in hibernation and the drugs cannot get into a cell that is hibernating. So kick and kill, I say, is a way to wake up the cell to get the drug is in there. But is there another simple way anybody thinks of explaining the reservoir to somebody who is brand new to this so I can explain you know, that HIV is able to hide and why it's able to hide and why the drugs we have today cannot get into the reservoir. What do you, is there another better way to explain that? Or is my idea of hibernating cells and the drugs can't get in there the best way to do that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mark. One one respond, um, Mark. I I think you your explanation mirrors mine very closely, except I get less technical. I uh, I don't uh, use science terms when I describe it. Um, in fact, I try to do like a metaphorical thinking about it, and um, I've uh, had a lot of success. I've start off a lot of my talks this way, and I'm putting it in the chat for you, the link to it. Um, I call it the flower lesson, where I just use a field of flowers as an example. And there's one flower that's white and all the others are purple or you know, an example like that. And talk about, I talk about HIV being seen and not seen that way. So I, I do it in a less scientific way, but it's the same thing. You, you give them a little more science in your, your description. I totally don't even take it into the science realm. I take it into a field like that. And um, so if you look at the video and the link, you can see what I've just managed to do, but it mirrors what you do. And I think what you're doing is what you have to do is sort of break it down simpler. So if there are people who are thrown off by resting memory cell or talk of cells, then maybe you want to think of another metaphorical way of describing what's happening that's simple that people can understand with being evaded, whether it's um, flowers or yeah, something. I'm, I'm, I'm committed to actually teaching the science. So I, I, I do cool. use those terms and I explain cool. those terms, but to the researchers, is my explanation right? And is it a good way to explain it? Or do you think there are better ways to explain the reservoir? And I think the context of your explanation is, 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 is good because you know, you're know you obviously elaborating on the analogy and then explaining what it all means. So I don't know that there is anything wrong with that if that's you know, in, the, in the context of your presentation. I think the same thing is, you know, we've, I've, use that the you know if you're if you see in the uh you know a bird trying to find worms in the in the grass so or or bugs that you know if, if the birds are your immune system and they're trying to pick them out then they need to find them right and mm -hmm. if you have a, a a field full of rocks and you don't know which rock you need to lift in order to see the worms underneath the rock then the bird can't lift the rock so it's it you need to find some other way to kind of get that rock move so that the bird can see it right so you know it there's so many ways that you could elaborate on the concept of an immune system access to the drug access to seeing where the virus may be hiding i've seen other analogies of a pool full of you know those balls that you see on the kids uh, places uh, those uh, that you basically just jump in oh, and like all, the, all the balls are blue and then there's only one ball that's red and that's the reservoir and you know you have to like dive in there to try to find it because you can't really see it uh from afar <laughs> so there's so i guess my question my my answer to you is i don't know that there's a right or a wrong analogy as long as you put it in the context and you explain it thank you for that and kareen also dropped some gems in the chat box about reservoir metaphors. 
And then thank you, Beth, for that reference as well. She also referenced a slide from Durban with a single red ball in the pool full of pink balls. Thank you for that. Can I Other just say that, Luis, we love, you sound like an Irish poet with all of these, um, these uh, um, uh, you know, analogies. It's great. It's very helpful. <laughs> You're not Irish, too, are you? <laughs> no, sorry, Puerto Rican. <laughs> Beth commented, the Puerto Rican poet. We love it. <laughs> and so let's close this with uh, asking the community members here, what do you need from research to better advocate for a cure? What else would you need? Like Mark would Wagner, would you come off mute and elaborate a bit on your comment? I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of researchers making themselves accessible to community so that we may teach ourselves? Yeah, I think it's, you know, important that, you know, for us to know what is going on so that we can relay it and also for them to be available as we need um, to perhaps come on these community events such as today and, uh, you know, be able to answer those questions for a broader, broader community. So we need that support. We can't do it without them. Right. Any other thoughts, what you need? Sherry? Oh. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, thank you for inviting us today. I'm calling in from Canada. Um, one thing that we're doing that we find really helpful, and it might be helpful there as far as what we find we need here is information in lay language. So we've asked our scientists at, during our updates for the Can Cure team to give us a, an opening slide. I can see Ron is writing this as I'm speaking it. He's my, <laughs> my co-chair of the Advo Community Advisory Committee there to, to present one slide very simply telling us, you know, basically what the research is, what it hopes to accomplish and what it, what's the relevance. And uh, doing that in lay language. The other thing that we're doing, and in fact, we're meeting with them this afternoon, later this afternoon, is we're working closely with the lab students. Um, it's been a bit of a, a tug of war to get them on board. They are enthusiastic to spend time with us, as someone mentioned earlier. Um, but this, we've given them actually a project. We're working on lay slides for knowledge translation in the community and we've asked them to help us with that uh, by by uh, uh, putting together two, two or three three or four slides in lay language in very simple community uh, terms about their specific projects within the laboratories on our large team grant so that's one thing that we're working on so that so my my what we need from you is is again similar similarly opportunities to speak with you, opportunities to have lay language slides made either together or uh, from your students or ourselves, I guess, doing them and running them by you. All the things that you've mentioned uh, are working well for us. So it's continued doing that. And this format today was great. There wasn't anything I didn't understand. Great, that's great to hear. And we've done the same um, starting in Seattle and we're trying to push it. We've got the NIH to embrace it. It was called the community summary slide. and. We gave them specific questions of like, what was the main question? What were the answers? Um, we kind of went into the, I love the relevance of the questions. I love those. I love getting their assessment of their own work. Like, should we be excited about this or not? Yes or no, tell us like a little bit more. I think it makes it more human to talk about science that way. Um, and I know that a lot of times um, it violates that sort of dispassionate persona that researchers are trying to present that, you know, there's no human that's actually behind that and you know that this is very logical being spoken about but um, I'm awesome. glad to hear that things are going well in Canada. Thank awesome. you. Our last question from Josephine. Go ahead. And then we have some awesome announcements. Mm -hmm. Josephine, please unmute yourself and ask your question if you still have it. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I'm just adding on to what has been said. I mm -hmm. think uh, when the scientists come up with all the terminologies that are being used, I think it would always be better if 
a group of community people come on board to interpret or to um, simplify the language so that they're not the ones simplifying the language, rather probably the CAB members or other advocates are just on board to simplify that language and they can just approve whether it is uh, bring out the meaning that they want or it is not bring out the meaning that they want. Yeah. Thank you for that, Josephine. Um, really quick, mm -hmm. Anne had a super awesome question for community in the in the chat box. Anne, do you want to come off mute or do you want me to read it? It, it just it's like a really minor thing, but I figure since I have you here, mm -hmm. I would love to get your feedback. We are always told to put the community summary slide first, and that just seems weird because we haven't shown you anything and yet we're telling you what it is. And is that preferred by you or do you, I mean, I'm probably everybody has a different opinion anyway, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I like it better first. Right, I was gonna say, we've done it both ways in Seattle where we tested it. And I think it has more success when it comes first because it gives people a framework because then you get lost in the weeds, then you, all the acronyms come up, then everything, you know, you start getting excited about the science or explaining it, but we know we have something that helps guide us through those things that we're un, you know, unsure of. And I think that's why FIRST really is more successful, um, but it is weird to start off with it. But if you think about it, it, like just imagine anyone who might not have the same level of knowledge, you're giving them a backpack so they can go on the hike with you. Oh. Again, another one of Michael's colorful interpretations, right? We'll take that with us. The community yeah. slide is like the backpack. Mm -hmm. The presentation is like the hike and we're going together. So hopefully that answers your question. He is a poet, Jeff, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so as we approach the top of the hour, I wanted to give my most humble thanks to the presenters here today, mm -hmm. those folks who joined us uh, from wherever you are in the world. Michael has been blowing up the chat with the session three feedback form. Yes. Please, please, please take a moment to complete that feedback form. You will be entered into a raffle to win one of four. Yes, five. four. Five, 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 five. Five, oh, five <laughs> now. Five, not four, but five. $50 gift cards. I don't Michael, know. Didn't say anything about it? Indeed. Yeah. So nope. Well, I'll be doing that. You have until tomorrow night to get it filled out and get it to us. And then I will be doing the drawing and announcing the, all the winners of all three sessions um, via email. So everyone will get to learn that who has won the gift cards. Cool beans. Well, Danielle, I appreciate you so much doing this with you. It's right back at you, kiddo. Yes. And I wanted to thank also our researchers and our guests and our attendees who have a uh, uh, taking the time to come and ask questions and find out more. I think it's very important. We couldn't do it without any of you. I also wanted to thank Richard, especially, even Ooh, though he likes yeah. to stay off screen. He's our Keith Herring image. And, uh, and the mic. give us the last words. Richard, I wanted you to have the last words on this session in this workshop. Well, no, sure. Um, thanks, everybody, for participating. Thanks to you and Danielle for being the, the host with the most. Um, you know, it, it's one thing that the tag tries to, to put together every year. You know, we, we're not the best meeting organizers, so we need a lot of help from everybody. And they always go well because everyone um, helps out so much. And uh, we have great people willing to participate. And, and so particular thanks to everyone that's presented or, or served as a panelist including Josephine coming in all the way from Uganda. Yes. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank thanks you. so much all. Thank you all. So thank you all. Yes, we will officially end things to, for this. So be on the lookout. I'll make this video recording available um, as soon as I get it edited. Um, and so that'll be in a few hours and you'll get to see it all. Don't forget, there's the feedback form. Click on that link now so you can get to it and you can bookmark it so you can fill it out. If you can't fill it out now, there it is one last time. Yeah. And thank you all. So. Blessings to all of you, and Next year. let's get to a cure as soon as we can. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye, you. Bye, everybody. Great, bye. great call. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Take care. Have a good week. You too. Have a great time.